Today is, uh, we're on Cancer Day and their three-year theme is along the lines of I am and I will, which is a very motivating theme for our researchers. So today we're going to focus on some of the work that's being done here in HMRI and that work is, like all good science, a collaborative process, collaborative with people in this building and collaborative with other people nationally across Australia and internationally because if we're going to actually conquer cancer in one form or another we only do that by the best science and our scientists have to cooperate with the best in the world wherever they may be as well as being some of the best themselves so we're going to introduce you to some of the best people in the world here today. So we have research teams that are uh, dedicated to particular forms of cancer some very common forms some very rare forms and um, we'll be talking about some of those. So today, uh, so here in Newcastle, we've got uh, Professor uh, Jenny Martin and Professor Nicola Bowden, who are working particularly on the repurposing of drugs. And Nicola's going to talk to you more about that in a few minutes. And about some of the exciting potential that has for new treatments over the course of the next couple of years. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite Nicola to come to the stage. So um, many of you know that um, I speak quite often about ovarian cancer and that I am funded by the McGuigan family to work on ovarian cancer and that we, my group has previously worked on melanoma for a number of years. But I actually want to talk to you a little bit today in more detail about what we actually do. Um, and our focus and the focus of a very brand new centre here at the University of Newcastle and HMRI is um, drug repurposing. So we have the very long, illustrious title of the Centre for Drug Repurposing and Medicines Research. So I'm going to start by explaining what is drug repurposing. So just the term repurposing is a really um, hot topic at the moment, but has been around for hundreds of years. It's basically taking something that was designed or made for a specific purpose and then using it for something else. So the example of this piano, it was actually originally made to be a piano but has been turned into a beautiful water feature. And across the course of its life, it, there was probably thousands of people that looked at that piano and never ever thought of it as a water feature. So that's really, I guess, the way to describe what drug repurposing is as well. It's the process of finding a new medical use for an existing drug that was probably developed for a completely different <coughs> disease. The drugs that we look at might be currently approved and our group in particular focuses on drugs that have got approval and uh, are safe and being used in clinical practice. Some drugs that have been repurposed have been withdrawn because they didn't work very well or they had toxic side effects and were withdrawn from market or were not accepted basically sometimes for financial reasons from the pharmaceutical industry. So if we can find a better use for them, then we repurpose the drug. So why should we repurpose drugs? Why shouldn't we just keep making more and more new drugs that are fancy and work really well and have less side effects? But there's three main reasons why we look at drug repurposing. And they are, that it's time saving, it's more cost efficient, and the key thing for us is that it's safer for patients. So you can see on this diagram across here, if I get my arrow, this is a traditional drug discovery pipeline. So this takes approximately 12 to 16 years to go from testing a drug in the lab through preclinical testing um, and making sure that the drug targets what it should through early phase clinical trials and then phase two and three to make sure it's safe and we know the right dosing. Then it has to go through an approval process. And in the US, that's FDA. And in Australia, it's the, the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. That can take anywhere up to 16 years and cost up to $2 billion per drug and there's a huge failure rate. Not very many drugs make it to market and make it to approval. So you can see that's a huge cost to the industry, but also to the patients that are waiting for treatments. So drug repurposing or drug repositioning is the other name for it, takes on average about six years. And the examples that we've been um, running here in Newcastle have taken four years to get to patients. And they cost about 300 million. Ours didn't cost that much. <laughs> but, um, on average, it, it costs about 300 million to go through the entire process all the way through to approval. And, um, and that's a huge, huge cost saving as well. In terms of safety, when we repurpose a drug, 
It's already been through the toxicity studies. We already know the side effects. We already know the safe dosing. So we're not testing those things in patients for the first time. So the safety implications are much lower. We already know um, what's gonna happen in the patient. So ultimately it would, be, it would be amazing if we could have drugs like on the far side where you have developed one drug that's an anti-inflammatory and possibly also can be used for cancer treatment and have multiple purposes because it's going to be cost-saving cost in the long run. So I've got some examples of drug repurposing success. Does anyone know what the little blue Pfizer pills are? So, yeah, it's Viagra. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, come on, there's gotta be a few people here. Um, and I also told my team this morning that if they start getting ads for Viagra pop up in their feeds, it's because I've been Googling pictures of Viagra for my talk. Um, <laughs> So the little blue pill, or Viagra, I think most of you probably know this story. It was originally um, gone, it went through preclinical testing as a drug for angina. And it got two clinical trials and didn't prove to be very good for angina, but all of the male patients in the clinical trials had a side effect. Um, <laughs> that was reported um, and it actually became a repurposed drug very quickly and was the first drug to be launched in the erectile dysfunction market. And at its peak, it was selling, uh, it was making a profit for Pfizer, sorry, I can't spit that out, of $2 billion a year. Um, and the other thing to do with the, that I should probably point out with these drugs is that they have a very short lifespan of being able to earn money. So once this drug comes off patent, the company no longer earns any money from it. So this is now a generic. Any company can make, can make Viagra if they want to. Um, and so Pfizer has stopped, obviously, um, making an income from it. But that also makes it really, really tempting to repurpose. Because if you can find another use for Viagra, you can take out a new patent on it. And, um, and then also make some more money from the drug. So this was the first example that, and it happened by chance. It was complete, we had no idea this was gonna happen. And, um, and was the most successful drug repurposing study early on. The other cool drug repurposing study or story that I found recently while um, writing a big grant application to try and get this, this stuff funded was this, the story of thalidomide. So it's another drug that everybody knows about. In 1957, um, it came onto the market as a sedative for morning sickness. It didn't actually treat the morning sickness in pregnant women, it just sedated them so they didn't feel it anymore. Um, and it was used quite broadly across the whole world. It was marketed very quickly in multiple countries. Um, but obviously the consequence was the babies that were born with birth defects. And the reported cases are well up into the tens of thousands now of thalidomide babies. So it only actually was on the market for just under five years and was withdrawn really quickly. And obviously it had a really devastating effect. But in 1964, it actually was repurposed. So thalidomide um, was still floating around and was in most pharmacists' back cupboard. And there was a clinician in Europe who had some patients who had a really severe form of leprosy. And you can see there's an example of it here on the slide. It was a type of leprosy that has extreme pain and um, lesions or sores that just don't heal. So there was a particular patient that the clinician couldn't find any way of treating and also couldn't sedate, so he was in agony. And out of desperation, went to the pharmacist and said, is there anything at all that I can try to sedate this patient? And the pharmacist said, the only thing I've got left is some thalidomide. It was a male patient, so they said, we'll give it a try. And it worked. It sedated the patient. Um, he, was man he managed to get rest and um, start to recuperate. But the other thing that happened was that all his, his sores started to heal. So um, they did a larger clinical trial and discovered that this was actually a really effective treatment for this type of leprosy. And it was then taken over by the World Health Organization and run in larger trials. So over 90% of patients were cured very quickly within um, eight to 10 days of their leprosy. But the consequence was that female patients were still falling pregnant while they were receiving thalidomide. So there was a spike again in, um, in babies with birth defects. So it was withdrawn from market as a treatment because there was no way of controlling the female patients from falling pregnant. So it stopped being used. So it was actually a really good um, example of a drug that had multiple uses. 
Um, and I, I know that Anoop knows where I'm going next with this. <laughs> so then in 1994, 30 years later, there was a group in the US that actually discovered how thalidomide works and what it targets. And it actually is an anti-angiogenic, which means that it stops, it, it targets blood vessel formation and it can, um, it can inhibit blood vessels from forming, which is probably the reason for the birth defects. Um, but also uh, was then trialled and studied very heavily as an anti-cancer drug because tumours require a blood supply to grow and if you can cut that blood supply off, the tumour will stop growing. So it was tested in multiple different cancer types and found to be effective for multiple myeloma. So it was then repurposed and went to market as thalamid, um, and you can see it's thalidomide, and was used in clinical practice until um, there were better treatments that came out on the market several years later. But I think that there is still some patients that receive it in extreme circumstances, but um, particularly if they um, have obviously no other treatment options. So that's a really good example of a drug that's been repurposed three times. And most of those were by chance or by luck. Something was just noticed in the patients and, and a new drug, a new use for that drug was found. So I really like this quote from um, these two authors that wrote a review of drug repurposing. And they, they really summarised the way that we think about it as well. And the lesson from, from the thalidomide story is that no drug is ever understood completely. And, no rep and repositioning or repurposing no matter how unlikely, often remains a possibility. So we can really always find a new use for a drug if we look hard enough. So what about other drug repurposing studies in cancer? There has been a few and some big successes. So we know um, from the little dog with aspirin on his nose that aspirin is now used um, in preventative measures for colorectal cancer for high-risk patients. And that was after a really, really big long-term study that found that it was actually protective. Um, that's not my advice to go and take aspirin every day, <laughs> is the disclaimer I'm putting in. Um, but it's actually used for high-risk patients. The other thing that's now starting to become really obvious is that there's a lot of drugs that were developed for cancer that actually can be used for other diseases, and particularly orphan diseases. So we have these groups of diseases where there's no treatment for them. They're very rare, they don't receive attention, um, and they're very hard to run clinical trials in because the patient numbers are so low. So a lot of cancer drugs have been repurposed to treat orphan diseases. So we're seeing the, the um, reciprocal effect as well. So these are approved drugs through the FDA in the US that have been approved for a common disease and for an orphan disease. So most of these have happened by chance or by um, observing a change in the patients or, or a side effect. But, you know, we're going to run out of time and that's a really slow process to come up with new treatment options. So there's this very big international effort now to do drug repurposing on a large scale and removing the human observation and the human bias out of the process. So the Broad Institute um, in Boston have started running a drug repurposing hub. And what they're doing is actually taking all of the known drugs, screening them against thousands of unique proteins and thousands of cancer cells, and then making all that data publicly available. So we can actually go in and search for a drug we're interested in to see if it kills different cell types or different cancer types, or if it targets the protein we're interested in. So this is an enormous, huge resource that um, we will be able to use and we don't have to replicate. So this would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars to set up and it's all freely available to the public. And it was only um, about a fortnight ago that they published a big paper explaining this process and, and um, telling us about that it's, it's now open access. So what are we doing here in the Hunter in, at HMRI? We have several drug repurposing projects already underway and the two with little stars have gone to clinical trial. So um, Professor Jenny Martin has been involved in a study for many years looking at valproate in glioblastoma patients. Um, and that study came about from clinical observation. They actually noticed that patients who were receiving valproate because they, it's an anti-epileptic drug, they're having, patients were having seizures. The patients that were receiving that drug actually had a longer survival time than patients who were not receiving it. So it was repurposed into an early phase clinical trial and the patients um, based in Brisbane have been receiving valproate as part of their glioblastoma treatment. And um, 
I think they've just done their inter interim analysis ready to publish that data. The azacitidine and carboplatin in melanoma study is happening here in Newcastle. Uh, that all the patients so far have been recruited and treated over at the Calvary Mater. And this is, this is a study that I lead with Andre van der a melanoma oncologist. And we actually took two um, very old chemotherapy drugs, which are azacitidine and carboplatin, that do not work in melanoma. They never have worked on their own. And we're using them one after the other at very low dose, which doesn't kill the melanoma cells, but it makes them more visible to the patient's immune system. So what we're seeing is that we're freezing the patient's tumours in time, they're not growing any bigger. It's giving their immune system time to start to attack the tumour, and then we're giving the patient's immunotherapy to, to boost that along. Um, and we've had some really um, good success with that in prolonging the patient's lives. And this group of patients are the ones who have no more treatment options left. So if they don't come on our trial, there's, not, there's nothing else for them. Um, so yeah, we've had some great success with that, and it's about to open in Cairns as our second site. Uh, we have just finished a pilot study looking at PARP inhibitors, which is a particular protein involved in DNA repair. There's a, there's a class of PARP inhibitors that are approved for ovarian cancer treatment. They've taken a really long time to be approved and um, had some ups and downs with their success. So we screened the 9,000 known drugs that are, that are approved for human use to see if any other drugs inhibit PARP. And we had lots of hits. Um, and we've got one drug all the way through to the end of the preclinical testing in the lab. So that it, within the next 12 months, we'll start to design a clinical trial. And it's actually an antiviral drug that stops viruses from replicating. And it looks like it blocks PARP, but also starts to block cancer cells from replicating at the same time. Um, and we have two early phase other studies in collaboration with Brisbane and Adelaide, looking at kinase and endocytosis inhibitors. So these are broad, biological targets that we're just trying to find drugs to hit. So what's next? We have really big plans to make this a big program of research here in the Hunter. Um, our first target, which obviously is led by me, is doing a very large scale drug repurposing study for ovarian cancer. At the moment, we have no treatment options once a patient becomes resistant to current treatment. So we're going to screen, as you can see in our stepwise figure here, we're going to screen the 9,000 approved drugs that we know everything about at the moment, know all their toxicities and dosing. Um, and then it goes through a filtering process via in silico computer modelling and lab work till we get down to one or two drugs that we test in the lab. And if they have a positive result within 12 months in the lab, they go straight to a clinical trial. So every 12 months of this program, we are going to have a new clinical trial design ready to go, provided we can get access to the drugs. That's the only hiccup. Um, and if this works successfully, we will then expand to all cancers and do the same thing again, um, but at about 200 times the size, and then eventually expand to other diseases. And the whole point of this is to become self-sufficient. So as we're doing our research-based work, we also can show really successful results to bring in service from the pharmaceutical industry. So they can bring, pharmaceutical companies can bring us their old drugs and say, please find a new use for this, and we can put it through our, our pipeline funnel and, and see if it has a new use, which helps them, obviously, to make um, something they've invested a lot of money in um, more sustainable and helps us as well to get more treatments into the patients. So that's it. I'm just going to acknowledge our team here, which is new and, um, and growing, and we're very happy to collaborate with anyone who either has a drug they want to repurpose or a target they need a drug to find. Um, and also all our collaborators from all over the place that have helped us get to this stage at the moment. I'm happy to answer questions. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's, what's the time scale over which you want to take that 9,000 down to the 1 to 2? Yep. Um, so that we did a pilot run of that last year and it takes almost exactly 12 months to get to the, to the 1 or 2 and then it will go to clinical trial design after that. And that's for one particular target? Yeah, yep. So we have designed it to scale up to be able to do four or five targets a year. Um, and then if we can prove that we can do it at that scale, we'll, we'll go up again till we get to 10 or 20 a year. Yeah. If you have, um, or, or do you have, two drugs combined at any stage to, to come up with a better result? 
Yes. So the question is around combination of drugs to get a better result than one drug alone. Yep. So. Um, yes, short, an short answer is yes. Um, but what we do through that, out that year of collecting preclinical data, we actually start to look at what effect the drug's having on the cells. And it might be that we have to combine one drug that starts to kill the cells and another drug that starts to trigger the immune response, for example, and putting them together. And we actually found with our clinical trial pre-data that we collected in the lab, we needed to give the drugs one after the other, not at the same time. And that was from really understanding the biology of the, of the response to the drugs. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention is that we also are looking at repurposing drugs to make the current treatments work better. So the standard treatment that patients already get, making that bet work even better, or even lowering the dose of what we get at the moment. Okay. In the centre, please. Good question. So let me see if I understand the question properly. You're, you're, you're saying we've got, we're trying to take 9,000 down to two. How do we screen drugs out along the way and why would we screen them out? Yep. Okay. That's a really good question and one I can answer ad lib because I've just written a massive grant application that explains <laughs> it. <laughs> so we start by using a com computer modelling which takes the structure of the drugs and looks for the structure of the target that we want to bind and that whittles it down usually to a couple of hundred. Um, then we go through a process of looking for, we, we're actually going to screen them large scale to see if they kill cells or if they do anything to, to target the cells at all. If we get a hit there, we'll then take the drugs, which will probably be somewhere between 50 and 100 that still have an effect. Um, then we'll look at the toxicity and side effects of those drugs. Um, distribution, so where they go in the body and the dosing, um, everything we know all, already from when they went through their first lot of screening. Um, and then that helps us to screen out a lot of toxic drugs that we won't be able to use and won't be able to use at the dose that we need. Sometimes it's a 10 times higher dose that will kill the cells, but that's going to kill a person as well. Um, so once we get down, whittle that down, we then take them back to the lab again and screen them through a whole series of, we have some cell lines that grow in the lab that we'll screen first. And if they have an effect on those, we'll then progress them to, we have 3D patient organoids. So they're 3D, um, the cells from patients that will grow in 3D in the lab. And if they have an effect on that, that's the best indication we have then that we can take them to trial. Mm. So lots fall out on the way. <laughs> okay. Hey, please. I currently have ovarian cancer and I'm taking anastrozole. Is that a repurposed drug? So is anastrozolol a repurposed drug? It was used initially for breast cancer, uh, mainly for breast cancer. So it is being repurposed into other conditions that are dependent uh, on oestrogen, the hormone oestrogen, and block the actions of the hormone oestrogen. So I don't know which it came first in, so I can't answer that directly, but it is used for both. And if more money is thrown at this um, uh, research, can you do it quicker? So if we had lots more money, could we do it quicker? Yes. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> yes. Although if you look at the example I gave from the Broad Institute, that was funded to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. And they've very quickly put out this huge amount of information. Um, so it's, it really does relate directly to how much funding we have. We can do little pilot studies here one at a time, but if we had a big um, funding stream, we could do them at scale and do everything at the same time until we come up with, we probably then don't have enough clinicians to run the trials, so it would be our next problem. But yeah, our, our goal is to continually have clinical trial ideas coming out that we could, we could start in the patients. Okay, I'll try and win a big lotto. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will too. <laughs> Please. Do you get any funding from the drug companies to help you along the way? So is any, income from drug companies to help you? Yes, yep, so I'm going to be um, very honest. We've had a really good support from Merck for the um, melanoma clinical trial. So they didn't fund any of the preclinical work that we did in the lab. We took our idea to them and actually needed one of their drugs to run the trial. Um, and they gave us the drug for free initially. And then the results were so good, they actually started to give us money to run the trial as well. Um, but it's, it's a pro process called investigator-initiated. So when you go into an agreement under an investigator-initiated trial, 
it's run by us and it's our design, it's not designed by the company. Um, we just report back the outcomes. But the reciprocal of that is that they've also given us some drugs to do some preclinical work on that we might be able to repurpose because they haven't worked so well. This is actually a really big issue around repurposing drugs and what you do. Supposing you find one of these targets looks effective. You do your early phase trials, it looks promising. And then you're looking for many millions of dollars to actually take that into the large scale trials. Mm. They won't be as long as they would have had to be because the drugs you're using have already had their safety profile well defined. But at the end of the day, there are very few research institutes or charities or even governments who are prepared to put that money behind this kind of thing. It does often depend on having a commercial partner involved at some point. And of course, they're going to make money out of it, but ultimately it's for the gain of patients. So there's always a, a trade-off in this. And your last question, please. Um, Nicola, thank you. That was very interesting. You said that there's, with the repurposing, you can actually re take out the patent. So do the researchers take out that patent, or is it the pharmaceutical company? Mm -hmm. Good question, too. Do you want me to repeat it? <laughs> <laughs> um, the question was, with a repurposed drug, um, and if, if we find a new use for a repurposed drug, you can take a patent out on that. And the question was, do the researchers hold the patent or does the drug company? Um, and the answer is both, depending on the drug. So if it's a drug that's off patent and very old um, and nobody owns the commercial rights to it at the moment, you can take out a patent on its reuse. Um, but if it's, a if it's a drug that's under patent with a company already, it's actually very lucrative to go to them and say, you know, you could actually repatent your drug um, and make more money off it. Um, so it's probably depending, it really depends on the drug, but the situation would be that we would get it to the point where even if the researcher owned the patent, we would end up selling that patent over to a company that then wants to take that drug to market because we can't ever take it to market beyond the trials. So yeah, so it's really very much an industry partnership and we have to make sure that we have those discussions really early with the companies that make the drugs. Nicola, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, I, I think Nicola's uh, set stage for me to sort of go through um, a more a personal story and then um, how that, how as clinicians and as researchers, we're inspired by the challenges that our patients face and that sometimes provides us with the motivation and the reason to do things better. So I've just put up some of my um, conflicts of interest there. Um, so I'll take you through the story of um, a lady I knew very well and I managed a few years ago and she came to me very anemic, um, was bruised and was generally unwell with infections over three months. So all her blood counts were quite abnormal. Um, and the GP referred her across to me as a blood specialist. And um, we did a series of tests and one of the things we do is look at the blood as well as what we call as bone marrow or the factory where all the blood is made. And Unfortunately, it, it showed something called as an acute myeloid leukemia or very aggressive blood cancer. So that was unfortunate. And if you look at all the people with this particular type of cancer, um, you'll find that majority of the people who have this cancer um, are in their 50s to their 70s. So it seems to affect the older adult population and for various reasons um, if you look at what the outcomes for patients with this particular cancer are um, those who are older tend to do worse for again a variety of reasons so we find it challenging to treat patients with intensive chemotherapy because of age and other and other sort of complications um, and the standard treatment, which I've put here as an acronym, LDAC, um, has traditionally got very low response rates. So less than one in five patients will even respond to it for a few months. So 
a number of new drugs had been discovered in the US um, for many other blood cancers, and I've listed those blood cancers there. But for acute myeloid leukemia, there were not many treatment options at that time. So together we shed a few tears. But also, it was a very new era of research into this cancer. And there were a few groups across the world which were working towards new treatments. Um, there was one particular targeted therapy group um, that had set up a global trial with a new drug that was actually developed in Melbourne. So we looked at this drug and we basically, it was a very innovative approach to treating cancer. Um, traditionally, cancer cells switch off their death signal so they don't any longer die, they just survive and live on and destroy all the normal cells around them. And this drug actually turns on the death signal again, allowing the cancer cells to die. So that was a new innovative approach that was uh, sort of brought this drug into acute leukemia trials. And so we, we conducted this early phase trial and this lady actually went on to this trial. Um, there were two Australian sites and several other international sites and um, this trial uh, was pivotal and led to the FDA approving this drug as standard of care last year in the United States. So it was a major advance for people with this type of aggressive leukemia and it was a simple oral tablet that they could take. It wasn't an intensive chemotherapy that they needed to be in hospital for, for weeks on end. It was something that they could orally consume and go back and live with their families. We thought that was very important for a regional cancer center like ours, where a lot of people are dislocated from their families and have to come into a major tertiary center for weeks to months to be actually treated for their cancer. So six months onto the trial, she was in complete remission, doing really well. No infections, spent the school holidays with her grandkids, and went on a short holiday up the coast. So she was doing very, very well. And the question she asked me at the time when she came back for a review is, will I relapse? Will this disease come back again? And I was sweaty. Uh, because at that point in time, I really didn't know how to answer her best. Um, and then at about a year and a half, the blood counts worsened. Uh, and we repeated all the blood work and a test and it, the disease had unfortunately come back and she came off the drug and went on to receive best supportive care. Could we have predicted and prevented this relapse? And, and that's when we started the work um, within our diagnostic lab in trying to say, can we predict which, which of our patients are more likely to relapse? And then can we do something about it? And then can we actually choose better treatments for each individual cancer patient in a way that their particular type of leukemia can be treated more effectively? And can there be a strategy for, you know, some sort of long-term treatment? So it's not just treating the cancer when you go into remission, but can you have some sort of long-term, low-intensity treatment that prevents a relapse, particularly in those who are at high risk for relapse. So if you look at the, if you look at the strat, if you look at what happens, so each of these circles represents a cell. So when, at, at your left hand corner, on, on the left, is a group of many different cells. So we are all made of many different cells. And when one of these particular type of cell starts to live longer and starts to divide more and more, you develop a cancer. And we often start with, you know, a precancerous state. In most cancers, there's a precancerous state. And then it grows on to become obvious when the numbers increase. And then when you have a significant amount of cancer cells, uh, we actually detect cancer. You have to start with treatment. 
and once you start treatment most of the cancer cells go away but a couple of them may lurk around and then come back and that's when relapse ha ha happens so there are three strategies uh, that one could oops That one could use one is to detect one is to use combinations so somebody asked a question earlier can you use combinations of treatment so you can often use combinations of different treatment to reduce the risk of relapse you could try and detect the relapse early and you could try and do what is called as maintenance treatment to try and prevent relapse occurring altogether. So these are just general principles which we could use for many of the cancers. Um, we tried to see if this, these could be applied to leukemia. Uh, so there's a state of art of detection of leukemia that we currently have in the pathology service that can detect down to very low levels of cancer. Um, but there's more work we can do in this area, particularly analyze every single cancer cell and shed light on how different cancer cells can be heterogeneous and therefore tackling each different cancer cell means uh, we need to know which of those cancer cells are more prone to be a resistance mechanism when the patient finally relapses. and this work is being led by Heather and a group we're doing some really state-of-art uh, single-cell work into leukemia. Uh, what we do have at the moment is a statewide genomic blood cancer testing program where we test each leukemia for specific genetic changes and then try and see if those genetic changes can predict for relapse or for particular types of treatment. So we're also now focusing on uh, detecting pre-leukemia and develop tests that predict the risk of progression and resistance across many different blood cancers. So leukemia, myeloma, lymphoma, and so on. And Nadine and Lisa are involved in this um, work. So going back to the patient, say we were able to detect what the unique genetic changes in each cancer cell was or in a group of cancer cells were, can we pick a target or a combination of targets based on the abnormality picked in that leukemic cell which we could focus on to treat that particular patient? So that's the next level uh, that we would like to reach in order to beat such aggressive cancers. And in fact, we were lucky to be funded by um, the National um, Funding Agency, NHMRC, um, and a few of the colleagues um, that I work very closely, so Nikki Verrills, Matt Dunn, and Catherine Skelting, um, are all involved in looking at different mechanisms by which we can actually detect um, the ways in which we can actually beat the cancer cells' progression. Uh, combining drugs, we've also taken to the clinical stage. So now we know a few genetic markers within the cell that predict for relapse and that predict for resistance. And we've taken it to a national platform study called the Intervene Study, where we're not just using two drugs, but we're using three drugs in acute leukemia and quite novel agents to try and intervene at a very early stage to prevent the disease from relapsing. So locally, we are developing molecules that can target three different um, sort of proteins and pathways within the leukemic cell. And uh, Nicola mentioned the PARP pathway. But there's also other pathways which affect the way DNA is modeled. Um, and that is what we are trying to target as well. As, and then we will try and take these drugs back into the platform trial that we have going at the national level. So if you look at long-term outcomes, they're, they're determined by genetic determinants. So the type of genetic changes 
determine whether this particular patient is likely to relapse or progress into the future. And the other way we've tried to tackle the problem is by maintenance studies. So after your initial treatment, can you put the patient on a particular drug that you select specifically for that patient and maintain the patient on the drug at a very low dose to prevent the relapse from happening, very similar to what you would do to control diabetes or high blood pressure. And that's what we've come up with, again, at a national level, um, looking at maintenance drugs and selecting the maintenance depending on the genetic change that occurs in each individual patient, leukemic patients, cancer cells. And we pick the one that might work best for the patient and then put them on the maintenance trial to try and delay or prevent relapse altogether. And compared to even three or four years ago, now we have a whole range of treatment options at every stage of disease for particularly aggressive blood cancers like acute myeloid leukemia. And we can introduce these through clinical trials at very first time a patient is diagnosed or maintain them on a drug to prevent relapse or progression of disease and at the time of relapse. So all our research is geared to bring hope and a smile for every cancer patient and the three-dimensional approach we've taken to this is focus on early diagnosis and detection of relapse, develop more oral treatments on a broad scale and incorporate these into clinical trials which test novel combinations. And hopefully we've changed Mrs. E.H.'s story from no options to plenty more options. And this wouldn't have been possible without help from patients like Mrs. E.H. who agreed to go on the clinical trial, funding from the community. We, a lot of this work was funded in the initial stages from HMRI's community directed uh, donations and funding and a number of partners, um, people support, project support and patient support have made this sort of work possible. Thank you. So the question is, <laughs> do the blood used for leukaemia cross the blood-brain barrier? And I guess, is your concern here that some of the cells might lurk within the brain and therefore be protected, not, the drug might not get at them? No, no, just wondering whether it's possible for those, because leukaemia is a blood cancer, is it possible that they in turn perhaps could benefit brain Okay, cancers? so a bit of a, can, can the same drug be repurposed for other cancers like, for instance, brain cancers as well. So, new. Um, so traditionally, a lot of the drugs used in leukemia treatment don't cross the blood-brain barrier. And there are certain subtypes of leukemia where the leukemia does have a higher chance of relapse in the brain. And we have to use slightly different drugs to tackle those. Um, yes. Please. When you spoke of the genetic changes that cause the cancer cells to develop, um, are they spurious events or are they sort of pre-programmed in the cells? So the question is, what's triggered the cell to actually become malignant? Is it something that's pre-programmed or is it just chance in some ways? We think in majority of the patients, it's a random event that occurs in a cell within the body. In a very small uh, proportion of patients, there might be a change that you inherited that may predispose, but this is a real small minority. In majority of the patients, it's a random event that occurs. So it's specific for the cancer cells. So if you checked the other cells in the body, they would be normal. But there are predisposing factors like sunlight for melanoma or yeah. cigarette smoking for Absolutely. lung cancer and some that will trigger the change Absolutely. and increase your chances. And again, that may be an interaction with some form of genetic predisposition that we don't fully understand yet. Absolutely. Okay. Go, please. Can you, can you prevent chronic myeloid leukemia from becoming acute? Um, chronic myeloid leukemia is one of the greatest success stories we have. 
Um, if you took a patient who lived with chronic myeloid leukemia in the 90s, most of them would transform to an acute myeloid leukemia within about five years. Um, however, that's changed dramatically. So trials in the early 2000s, uh, there was a tablet form of treatment, targeted treatment that was introduced that has made uh, or cured more than nine out of every 10 chronic myeloid leukemia patients. So that's a success story. And we've actually prevented that from happening in majority of the patients. Okay. What kind of time scale between when somebody's referred to you and the first love treatment? So time scale from diagnosis and first referral to an OOP to actually starting treatment. So uh, uh, an acute myeloid leukemia is a medical emergency in oncology. So most of these patients will be admitted within 24 hours of uh, our knowledge of what's happening in the patient. They may be out in the country, so by the time we get them into the hospital, it'll be 24, 48 hours, and the treatment often starts within a few days. The initial treatment doesn't depend on a whole lot of testing that I've described here, so that starts off, and then there may be additional changes that we do along the way, depending on all, when we get all the information. So it's, the treatment starts within a few days of diagnosis. Specifically with uh, follicular lymphoma, which is close to my heart, or close to my veins, on my maintenance at the moment, um, I believe the CD20 protein is what causes the, the, uh, the red cells becoming cancerous. Is that mechanism yet understood, how that CD20 protein is generated in the body? So Anup, I'm going to let you summarise that question. <laughs> yeah. um, the question is, um, in follicular lymphoma, the CD20 protein is excessive, and how does that happen, um, and what is the mechanism behind it? Have I, have I rephrased that correctly? Yes. So uh, interestingly, the CD20 protein um, is present in what we call as B lymphocytes, so lymphos lymphocytes are a normal part of our immune system. So they fight against viral infections, bacterial infections, and they're, they're part of our immune army, if you like. So what happens in this particular type of lymphoma, which is a cancer of the lymph glands, is that this particular protein called CD20 is expressed or is present on the surface at very high levels, much more than what happens with normal cells. We actually don't know why this happens, but we've used it to treat patients and you know, used it to our advantage to create treatments for patients by creating an antibody using the immune system to actually attack those cells which have a lot of CD20 on their surface. So we have created an antibody that we can inject into the, into the human vein and this antibody goes and sticks onto these cancer cells and gives a signal to the immune system to attack these cancer cells. So in that way, we've harnessed our knowledge of the excess CD20 on these cancer cells to treat these patients very effectively. So Luke, I'm going to ask the last question, which is, this is a, an area of huge amount of research going on. You're heavily involved in a lot of it. But as a practicing clinician, how do you keep track of what's going on? How do you know what the best treatment is for the individual patient? Because there are trials going on all around the world, they're reporting at different times. Is it all a bit of a mess? Or is, is it actually more rational than that? <laughs> um, I would say we, we're fortunate in, in Australia because um, both locally and in Australia, so locally in the Hunter, we are actually a fairly small community of haematology or blood cancer researchers and we, we try and meet every few months to update ourselves and update each other with, with our research work. And also uh, the network of blood cancer researchers in Australia is quite strong. Um, and we meet every six months and within blood cancer, it's, uh, blood cancer is a broad term, but each of those cancers 
have their own different treatments. So myeloma has a different treatment, lymphoma has a different treatment, leukemia is all, you know, there's a mixed bag of uh, cancers and each of the specific leukemias is a diff different treatment. So we've got uh, disease streams and we've got leaders within the disease streams um, with, who meet every six months. So uh, myself, I'm involved with the leukemia and myelodysplasia, which is a pre-leukemic condition disease stream. And we update each other and we develop the clinical trials for all the clinicians in Australia to participate in and promote it amongst the haematology colleagues so that uh, they can communicate out to the patients and the community so that we can make those trials uh, work for the patients. Thank you very much, Yudu. Thank you. So, thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be able to present research that has been so well supported by the hunter back to the community itself, and also hopefully to hear a little bit more about where this research could go next. So I wanted to talk about the journey that a distressed cancer patient might go through here in the hunter, but also more broadly in Australia. I wanted to tackle three big questions. So what is distress and why is emotional well-being important? How is distress identified in cancer services? And how many Australian cancer patients are currently being asked about their emotional well-being? Now, these are three really big questions, um, and it absolutely would not be possible to answer any of these without the wider um, team of researchers right here in the Hunter that work in supportive care and are experts in this field. Um, it's also really well supported um, by community organizations such as the Hunter Cancer Research Alliance, the Cancer Council, HMRI, the Mark Hughes Foundation, and the Cancer Institute. So coming back to this first question, what is distress? So distress is a negative emotional experience that interferes with an individual's ability to cope with their diagnosis or treatment or outcomes. And it's the second part of this definition that's particularly important. It's when distress becomes intrusive and it interferes with a, a person's ability to get the best care or the best outcomes possible. And unfortunately, there's a lot of causes for distress for cancer patients. So these are just some of the really common ones that I've pulled out. So it might be that there is unmet emotional needs. So this is a time of uncertainty and shock for a lot of cancer patients. And they might already have anxiety and depression before they even received their cancer diagnosis. There might also be a lack of treatment information um, that they really need and would like. So they're not really quite sure how they might respond to treatment and what their side effects might look like. Um, they might have to make really complex treatment decisions and there might not be a lot of information out there to guide them on what might be best for them. There also might be um, unmet sexual concerns or changes um, in their relationships with their significant others or their partners. So for example, in cancer types such as prostate cancer or gynecological cancers, there might be changes in their actual functioning after treatment, but also changes around fertility and body image. And these often go unmet in cancer patients. There could also be financial concerns as well. So we know that around 30% of individuals will report that they're having difficulties paying their usual bills. And unfortunately, from research that we've done here in The Hunter, we know that around 90%, this will be the first time that they have issues paying their usual bills. So this is a new and awful experience at a time when things are already really difficult. And on top of that, there's just the physical symptoms and side effects of having cancer. So things like pain, nausea, and fatigue. So as you can see, lots can go into a person feeling distressed. So one of the most common questions that I get when I explain my research is, well, of course, Liz, of course people are distressed. It's cancer. It is going to be an awful experience. And I absolutely agree with that. Distress might be normal, but it is still important. And why it is important and why it's clinically significant is because we know that there are things that we can do to help alleviate this level of distress. There are really good interventions out there that if we can just get patients to them, we can reduce these levels of distress. So this clinically significant distress is also experienced by quite a large group of patients um, in the community. So around 45% of patients will experience clinically significant distress. 
and 40% of their caregivers and their loved ones will also experience clinically significant distress. So if we leave it untreated, this is all of the things that it could potentially lead to. So it can lead to clinical depression and anxiety for both patients and caregivers after their treatment and long into survivorship. It reduces patients' quality of life and it's also associated with worse physical symptoms, things like breathlessness. And finally, it impacts treatment success. So individuals who are clinically distressed are less likely to finish their treatment. So how I like to think of this is clinically significant distress is like putting a backpack, a very heavy backpack on a cancer patient and asking them to still climb that mountain. We know that there are things out there that we can do to help lighten this load for individuals. So now that we know that distress is prevalent, it's important, it leads to a whole bunch of negative outcomes for patients and their caregivers, it's really important that we identify those individuals as soon as possible so we can get them the help that they need. So how is a distressed patient identified? I want you to imagine that you're a cancer patient who has pain, this is a roughly 60%, nausea, and fatigue. You also need to make a decision about a treatment, so that might include whether or not you want to opt on to a clinical trial, whether or not your current treatment, the side effects are something that you can continue to cope with. You also had a test a few weeks ago, and you've done your own reading, and now you've got a few extra questions that you want to ask. You're struggling to pay your usual bills for the first time. And your significant other who comes with you to every appointment has phoned the Cancer Council and has a list of questions that they would like to answer as well. Now you've seen this health professional a few times before, two to three times, and you know that the clinic is running late. And the opening question about your emotions is, how are you? How would you unpack all of that in this one question? I know I certainly ask, get asked this question and sometimes I just say, I'm fine. No big deal, and you just move on to the next thing. So we asked patients, how would they respond um, if they were asked about their emotional well-being, or how would they respond to this, how are you question? It's really complicated. So um, these are quotes from patients right here in the Hunter. As I said, it's not so much the medical issues I've got issues with. Well, I can't work for a start, and yes, side effects, which is sometimes people don't understand. Because they can't see anything, they think you're fine. So it's a hidden um, side effect of cancer. Everything happened so quickly. If they had just given me 10 minutes to sit around and stress about it, things might have been different. And then there's also a real sense of stoicism um, of people just trying to do their best and do it tough. So you've got to sort your own stuff out. Nobody's going to do it for you. Or I can't really raise like the whole talking about feelings. Like I've been distressed, but I usually just laugh it off. So for these reasons, along with other reasons, um, we know that distress is underdetected in our cancer services. So the majority of physicians will actually underestimate the amount of distress that their patients might be going through. So somebody might come into a clinic and be severely distressed, but their health professional might think that they might be minimally or moderately distressed. So the severity of it is not always accurate. But even if you take us, us out the severity and just ask, yes or no, is that individual distressed? Only 64% of cancer patients would be correctly identified as being distressed. That means that we're missing 36% of people in services that we know that we could lighten that backpack. It fares even worse for distressed survivors. So one in 10 are correctly identified within primary care or in their GP practices. Now, I am absolutely not saying this is because health professionals are bad at their jobs. What I am saying here is that it is a very time poor environment and they are coping with just as many of those issues like the pain, the nausea, the fatigue, the treatment decisions, the clinical trials. It is a very complex thing to unpack. And after listening to Anoop, we all know how empathetic and considerate physicians really are here in the Hunter. It's just a difficult conversation to have. So the other thing is that patients themselves just might not want to have this conversation. I didn't want to talk to anybody about this. It was a little frightening. It wasn't okay to say it out loud. Like me, I hide a lot, so people, they don't tell you things. But then there also might just be a mismatch of priorities. The focus was on practical issues. You have breast cancer, you're gonna have chemotherapy and surgery. 
find that's important too, but they didn't ask about how I felt. I wasn't able to focus on practical issues because of my emotional situation. So sometimes people just might not be able to get from point A to B of making a treatment decision because of their emotional well-being, but they don't know how to raise that within that standard consult. So this has led to some really great international guidelines and Australian guidelines from places like the Cancer Institute and Cancer Council suggesting that we should be asking every patient to rate their level of distress at every appointment and then to discuss these scores if appropriate. So if somebody scores on zero to 10, how much distress are you experiencing today with 10 being extreme distress and zero being no distress? If somebody says eight, we should probably start that conversation about what eight actually means to that patient. And finally, we should be making referrals to supportive care. So that might be um, seeing a psychologist in the service or talking to a cancer survivor or a peer who's gone through the same experience that you have. And we know that patients like this idea. So somebody needs to take the lead at the start. It was daunting. Being asked about my distress or feelings was like having a hug without the hug. I felt reassured when asked about my distress. Until then, I was unaware that I was even distressed. So for patients themselves, this might be the first time that they think of their emotional well-being as being clinically significant. It's a really important conversation to have. And for the clinicians and the researchers in the room, it is also associated with clinical improvement. So patients who self-report their symptoms, like distress, alongside of pain and nausea and fatigue, have improved quality of life compared to usual control patients. They're also less likely to use an emergency room, which is a stressful and costly environment to be in. And this is the one that gets most people very excited. There's also a median overall survival improvement of approximately five months. So people actually do better when we start to ask them more about their symptoms, including their emotional well-being. Asking about people's distress also changes the content of those consults. So different topics are raised for the first time. So this study from LeBlanc in 2017 suggested that the, the number of times that sexual unmet needs were discussed in those consults increased once people started asking about their emotional well-being. It also leads to increased utilization of supportive care, so people are getting more referrals and they're using them and they're benefiting from them. And it also increases patients' involvement in care. So by having this larger conversation, patients feel like they can participate a little bit more in that partnership, and that often leads to increased satisfaction as well. So these are some of the benefits that patients have told us about using their own words. So they feel like being asked about their emotional well-being was preventative. I knew I was falling in the hole again, and I'm lucky I had good support around me. I just managed to pull myself back out again. It also helps with continuity. I can see that you're still highly distressed. Is there anything that you want to talk about today regarding it? Because people's emotions will change over the time that they have cancer. They might be doing really well at some points, and then they might have really bad days or bad times. It also provides encouragement or acknowledges people that might get little informal support from elsewhere. Questions, oh no, that's a good idea though because there are some people that can't talk to family or friends. If they're having difficulty, then they might be encouraged to go and talk to somebody about it. And most importantly for me, um, doing distress screening and asking about emotional well-being and having that conversation helps people to know what is actually available and out there. It was that lady that I first spoke to who, as I said, checked in with me and explained the services and all that sort of thing. And I was like, oh wow, there's actually this amazing resource out there. People don't know what they don't know about the services that are out there. They really need a health professional to introduce those different types of referrals to them. So I think a lot of people don't know that or might not know that this resource is there and it might not be in the front of their mind anyways. Okay, so we know distress is important. We know that patients want us to ask these questions and that there's benefit behind asking these questions. So how often does this happen in our cancer services right now? So in 2018, we did a national audit where we actually asked 120 cancer services across the country to tell us whether or not they were asking these questions and how they used the information. So normally I would just crush people with numbers here, but I thought this might be a better way to do it. So imagine that there are 10 cancer patients. We ask cancer services, did you ask about their emotional well-being? 
So two of these 10 individuals would not be just screened for distress because the service that they went to simply doesn't ask about emotional well-being in a consistent manner. So we lose two individuals immediately. Two individuals weren't asked or screened for distress because they just didn't seem distressed at the time that they were in the clinic. So they didn't seem anxious, they didn't seem on edge, they didn't seem worried, they were never asked. One individual wasn't screened because they didn't have the high risk trait that the health service looked for. So distress could be higher in specific cancer types that have poor prognoses, um, but it could also be higher in um, the elderly, specific genders um, and education levels. But this person didn't have one of those high risk traits despite being distressed. So we lose another individual here. We also lose another individual because the treating person that they saw, their health professional, didn't screen. The health professional in the room next door might have, but just luck of the draw, they saw somebody that didn't screen. So from 10, just for asking that one question, we're now down to four cancer patients. So of the four remaining, two were screened with interview and with a questionnaire. For the people that were done just screened by having a conversation with the health professional, we know from the previous slide that physicians aren't always accurate in picking up distress. So we lost one patient this way as well. So now we're down to three out of 10. Of these three, two of them received referrals to supportive care. One received four referrals from a health professional who'd been in the area for a very long time. She knew all of the different services out there. She's very experienced. He got a lot of different options to pick for. However, the other individual spoke to somebody who's relatively new to the area. She wasn't really quite sure what would be best matched to help that individual. And one individual received the referrals that was perfectly matched to his level of distress. So for example, he was severely distressed. He received a referral to speak to the in-service psychologist. Now, just before you're thinking, I really hope I'm this gentleman in the orange shirt, you would have to flip a coin to see whether or not he was ever asked about his distress again. So if he came into a service and he was having a good day, he didn't want to talk about his emotional well-being, he might have been missed. He might have ended up being one of the other nine. So this sounds quite grim, um, but there's actually a lot of positives um, that have come out of our data and our research and supportive care in the last year or two. So the first thing is that um, distress is absolutely normal, but we know that it is still important and it is an important clinical outcome for us to help to treat. We also know that cancer patients would like to have this conversation with their healthcare professionals and they would benefit from additional support. So the things that I would suggest to the community um, is if you have cancer yourself or if you care for somebody um, who does, just know that distress is normal. Start the conversation with your healthcare professional if you feel comfortable to do it or just start the conversation with your support network or your loved ones. And you have to keep having this conversation as well. Emotional well-being changes over time. I'd also like to just give a plug for the Cancer Counselor 131120 service. Um, a lot of this data actually comes from speaking to people who use the 131120 service. Um, and they have a great um, resource and directory of different supportive care services, along with the idea that they screen every caller for their emotional well-being and have a more in-depth conversation with them. So, great resource. And finally, if you have had a positive or negative experience with being asked about your emotional well-being or receiving this type of care um, in the area and you'd like to share your story, get in touch because our next step for this work is to actually go out to health services and try to help them to integrate distress screening and emotional well-being as much as possible into their usual practice. And one of the best ways for us to do that is actually provide patient stories because those are the ones that motivate us all to do things, including researchers. So thank you so much. So yep. question, <laughs> would you recommend a validated questionnaire to identify patients at risk of distress? Absolutely. So um, there are really good guidelines out there for exactly how we should be asking patients about their emotional well-being. And the first step is to use a validated screening tool so that we can very quickly 
identify those people who might be experiencing distress. So one of the examples might be the distress thermometer, which is that zero to 20, 10 example that I gave earlier. The other one that's really persuasive is a tool called the Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale. And that one's really useful because it doesn't just ask about depression, anxiety, and distress, but it also asks about the physical symptoms that can feed into distress, like pain, nausea, and fatigue. So for health professionals, it's almost like getting a really good bang for your buck. You get not just depression and anxiety, but you also get pain, nausea, and fatigue. So I'd, I'd recommend looking at those ones. Yeah. Other questions? Please. Um, hi, that was really interesting. Do, do you have a sense of how well or otherwise um, clinicians here in the, the, the Hunter area do in terms of um, using those patient reported outcome measures? So that's or conducting those surveys to, to elicit that and, and go from there? So the question, yeah. The question is how well in the Hunter are we using um, screening surveys and patient reported outcome measures like distress screening um, to inform patient care? Is that okay? Um, so the Hunter actually has a track record of doing this stuff over the last decade. Um, so one of the projects um, that has been going on for the last few years is one where every patient that comes through um, the Calvary Mater is actually asked on a computer to fill in the distress thermometer and a pain thermometer. Um, so I definitely think that the Hunter is on its way to doing that. Um, just like implementing any new clinical activity in a health service, there's always going to be some challenges. Um, and it's hard to maintain those things as well. So I think we're, we're, we're definitely getting there. Yeah. And, and just as a follow-on, the, the education that you're going to do as next step, is that only specifically related to cancer, or is it more general in terms of so the question was whether or not our next steps in educating health professionals about distress is cancer specific or whether or not we'll be expanding that program out to other health services and chronic disease types. Um, so at the moment we're focusing mostly on cancer and that trial will be national. Um, so that's what I received funding from the Cancer Institute to do. Um, I would absolutely love to do it in other chronic um, disease conditions. Um, the one that I think has a lot of potential is actually in um, neurological conditions. So, um, for example, young survivor, uh, young stroke survivors um, could be a really good place to ask a little bit more about their emotional well being because that's a really common unmet need for them. Yep. And question at the back? Yeah, I, so I think the question is um, when we ask health professionals to um, have that conversation about emotional well-being, do they need to have it at every appointment? Well, I guess, yeah, ask them to help educate them as a health professional to ask that question. Yeah. Because so I mean to just fixing the patient Yep, so um, the education process for health professionals to um, encourage them to ask about emotional well-being a bit more. Um, there's some strategies that we can do to really implement um, distress screening and there's a whole field implementation science about how we can help clinicians to alter their behaviors to um, deliver interventions like this. So one of the, the biggest ways that we can influence clinicians to change their behavior is to show them the clinical value of doing that new activity. So that median improval time, if you have this conversation with your patients, you might increase their survival time of five months. That's very, very persuasive to clinicians. The other thing that's really persuasive is patient voices and stories and academics write papers and those kind of database papers, they don't have patient stories in them. It's the words that are actually really important and the faces. So when we deliver that training, what we will do is there'll be kind of four modules and those 
points that really help to reinforce a changed behavior will be echoed across all of those four training modules. And hopefully that way, um, we can persuade people about the value of, of having that conversation every time. Liz, thank you very much. very much for inviting me to talk today and I'd just like to reiterate Liz's sentiment and that's to say thank you to all of you because this is one project that truly couldn't exist without the support of the community. So when we talk about a biobank a lot of people aren't quite sure what biobanking means and I think the term conjures up any number of these ideas but the bottom right hand from your perspective image is what we actually do in biobanking. So our biobank here was formally established in 2012 and it's located here in the building downstairs and for any of you that have signed up for our tour after this session, we'll be taking you down there to see the biobank. It's a partnership between the university, the local health district and New South Wales Health Pathology and without any of those partners, we wouldn't be able to carry this project through but ultimately it's because of you, the community. So does anybody have an idea of what a biobank is? I've, I've put the answer up there on the screen. <laughs> but for anybody who wasn't sure what a biobank is, it's essentially a collection of biospecimens. For us, that's solid tissues and blood and other fluids. But for other biobanks around the world and even within the country and within the local community, that can be everything from seed banks, and there's one of those at the botanical gardens, to very specific cancer biobanks focusing on very specific subsets of patients and we have one of those within the Hunter Cancer Biobank. Biobanks are essential because they enable research to move from earlier laboratory models where we might be looking at human cell lines into actual examples of human disease that are taken from real patients which means that ultimately we can move our research from the laboratory, from bench to bedside, to actual patient clinical trials. So the samples that we have here at Hunter Cancer Biobank, we have both internal and external collections. I'll talk about our external collections a little bit in a moment, but as for our internal collections, we have a collection of blood samples, and they're drawn from our patients who are having regular blood tests while they're on their cancer journey. So we take an extra vial from those patients at that time and we bank that away for research use. We also collect solid tissue samples and that process is a little bit more detailed. So a patient with cancer will have surgery and this is to remove the tumour from them. Sometimes this is just a suspected tumour and for those patients who are lucky enough not to have a cancer, we can then bank what we call control tissue and that's tissue to compare to tumour samples. If the person does have a tumour removed, that tissue is sent to pathology where it's diagnosed as being a cancer. We then take a small amount of that that would normally have been discarded and we send that down here to the biobank where it's embedded in wax and filed away in our cancer biobank. So what we're doing here is saving tissue that would have been discarded and turning it into an invaluable research tool. Uh, in terms of what we have downstairs, so the collection that's stored in those wax blocks or as formal and fixed embedded tissues, we currently have 17,000 samples from 12,000 patients. Our blood collections are larger and that's because we're able to collect at more intervals as opposed to just at diagnosis and potentially when the cancer comes back for solid tissue. So for our blood samples we're at 44,000 samples. And we also have a virtual biobank, which is an exciting new project being driven by one of our investigators, Dr. Craig Getty. And that's about collecting images of samples so that researchers are able to look at the images of these structures and make some decisions and develop some hypotheses before they actually start working on the tissues themselves. In terms of our external collections, so we at the biobank here partner with a number of large organisations to coordinate samples that come in from clinical trials. So some of you may have seen in the news just recently, the Biobank has partnered with the Breast Cancer Trials Group, and that's to coordinate samples from all over the country and from New Zealand, and I believe they've now also got some trials running in the Asia Pacific region as well. So when these patients begin on a clinical trial, they have samples collected for screening, 
those samples will come here to us and then either at the conclusion of the study or sometimes years down the track those samples are used by researchers to have a look at the drugs and to have a look at some of the effects and to determine where to go to next with their trials and with their research. And we partner with a number of very large institutions to coordinate those samples and also outside of the cancer space we partner with groups working in neurology, in diabetes and a number of other disease groups. The other really exciting thing that we do here, so I'm sure there are some people in the audience who may have been on clinical trials in the past or potentially have had family members that have been on clinical trials and you'd be familiar with the fact that there is a screening process. So quite often these patients will have to submit tissue to the trial to determine whether or not they're eligible to go on that study and receive that treatment. That can be quite a lengthy process, particularly when we need the pathology laboratory to send tissue away. And these pathology laboratories are extremely overworked and in some cases under-resourced. So here in Newcastle we're very fortunate because the biobank actually looks after that process <coughs> with the goal of increasing the number of patients in the Hunter that are able to go on study, but also increasing the speed at which they have access to those treatments. And in 2019, which was the first year we coordinated that process, we actually saw a 5% increase in patients that were able to go on clinical trials. I have to reiterate, that is only in an adult context. We don't look after paediatric clinical trials, but even in an adult context, we feel that was a huge accomplishment. Our biobank also has a number of research services, and I won't go into these too much, but I will explain them a little bit when we move downstairs, and that's that we have equipment to do staining, to stain the tissue so researchers can look at exactly what those cancer markers are or what might be changing in the cancer, and also to be able to create things like a tissue microarray, which allows us to look at lots of different tissue samples all in one slide. Uh, to give you an idea of what we actually produce in a year, so this is a snapshot of our 2019. So as you can see, we had quite a number of samples coming in, but also we had quite a lot of samples going out. And in our definition, that's a successful biobank. It's one that has its samples going out into research so they can produce results and they can directly give benefit back to the community. So we started like this in January, and by the end of the year, I think our team resembled this <laughs> slightly more. It was a big year for us. So just to finish up, I'd like to give you a little bit of an insight into one of those cancer-specific programs that we run within Hunter Cancer Biobank, and that's our Mark Hughes Foundation Brain Bank. And this is a direct example of what we call patient-driven biobanking. So the Mark Hughes Foundation have sponsored us to specifically place a focus on the collection of brain cancer samples. Prior to this project, around 10 samples a year were being stored for brain cancer research, but in the first six months of the program, we were able to consent over 35 patients to our brain bank. One of the reasons that we haven't had as much progress in brain cancer is that there is very limited access to tissue for researchers. So in a lot of ways, there's still a lot that we don't understand, and it's because we can't really get in and see what's happening with brain cancer. So the goal of the Mark Hughes Foundation Brain Bank was to ensure that researchers had exactly what they needed when they needed it. So we collect sequential blood samples as patients move through their diagnosis, and we also collect a tissue sample right at the start at their diagnosis, and then again if and when these patients relapse and the cancer comes back. One particular patient changed the nature of our biobanking program. She was a patient who had been involved in our program right from the start and unfortunately entered end-stage disease in late 2016. She was a wife, a mother of four, and a foster mother of 85. So that tells you about the type of person this woman was. Absolutely remarkable. And making her even more remarkable, she had one final wish, which was to donate her brain to cancer research. This wasn't something that the Hunter Cancer Biobank had dealt with before, and indeed, when we looked into it, it wasn't something that had been done in a cancer-specific context. There were a number of options for brain donation, and I'm sure we've all heard in the news that there are quite a few programs running, both in Sydney and worldwide, looking at concussion and brain, uh, sport-related brain banking. And there's a lot being done in the mental health space for schizophrenia and for dementia. But 
Brain cancer presents a very unique challenge, particularly when you look at the state of disease and the fact that it's a very different disease progression. So we wanted to create something that would specifically focus on a brain cancer setting. And we were able to do that. And it all had to happen very quickly because unfortunately this patient did decline rapidly. But we were gained ethical approval to establish a four hour rapid autopsy program. That involves having a staff member on call 24 hours a day, all year round. And it also means that we have to be quite flexible because quite a few of these patients do choose to die in their own homes with their families, which means we have to build strong ties within the community to ensure we can have general practitioners or other health professionals to go into the home once the patient passes to limit the distress to the family and to make sure they have that support, but also to ensure that we can move things along quickly because we do have a very tight timeline. Our first donor passed away on Valentine's Day in 2017 at home with her family at the age of 62. And she began a remarkable legacy. When I completed these slides yesterday, that was for 13 patients that had contributed to our brain bank and sadly that became 14 last night. Mm -hmm. But again, it does show you that this program is working in real time and that we have a remarkable community of patients who are willing to stand up and do this, not for any benefit for themselves, but to really fight back and to help us work together to fight against brain cancer. Um, just some quotes I wanted to share with you. So from one of our donor's daughter, she said, I want to thank you for all the work you did to ensure that our father's final wish, the donation of his brain, could be fulfilled. I know a lot has to go right for it to happen and we sincerely appreciate the effort. It meant a lot to him and our family that we were able to help the cause to hopefully find, find better treatments and, dare I say it, a cure for brain cancer. And from our brain care coordinators, the thing they love most about the Biobank is it allows people who are suffering from this disease to stand up and fight the battle, not just for themselves, but also for others through contributing to research. And that's what's most important to us. And last year was a very big year for brain cancer research for us. Of the 13 grants that were awarded to researchers that collaborated with our Biobank, seven of those had a focus on brain cancer. So we're very, very confident that these samples will be used in the near future and that hopefully we'll be seeing some exciting results come out of those uh, tissue samples. So this is the wonderful team that I get to work with every day. Um, I haven't put contact details up there, but if anybody would like to know more about the Biobank, take some questions. Otherwise, please feel free to come up and have a chat outside.